Attack on Titan. You may have heard of it. It's great. The season 4 trailer dropped. Everybody's excited. Let's talk about it. But first, a history lesson about the author. Where it all began. Hajime Isayama, the creator of Attack on Titan. Isayama was born in 1986. He was born in the Oita prefecture, which is comparatively thought of as a rural and remote place. His early life was composed of being surrounded by the towering walls of Oyama's monstrous mountain ranges. As a kid, he was a big fan of Weekly Shonen Jump, particularly Hell Teacher Noob. Isayama spent much of his high school years creating and submitting manga to numerous competitions. Later on, he decided to study the medium academically at Kyushu designer Gokan. Isayama told his parents that he would like to become a mangaka only after he entered a professional manga school. His father's comments on it are as follows. I thought the probability of success for a mangaka can be very low. And I also had a feeling that it would be good for him to just take a normal job. Many sources claim that Attack on Titan is his first manga published as a mangaka. He managed to create a record-breaking mega-hit manga as his debut series. You know, stuff like that, like he was an overnight success. But while it is true, to some extent, it's not the whole story. In 2006, Isayama won a Fine Work Award with Kondansha promoted magazine Grand Prix. This gave a 20-year-old Isayama the confidence to leave the confines of the Oita prefecture for the sprawling metropolitan expanse of Tokyo. Whilst working at an internet cafe, Isayama further developed his winning one-shot with the intention of submitting to Tokyo's big publishers. He went to Shuisha's weekly shonen jump editors but they told him to make the artwork more appealing and to tone down the darker elements of the story to make it more palatable for the demographic. Isayama was like, no thanks but, and went on to propose the idea to different other publishers. In an interview with the BBC, Isayama admitted that after being rejected by publishers so many times, he nearly threw his creation in the garbage bin until Kodansha's Bitsetsu Shonen magazine accepted his drafts and it began serialization in 2009. He revealed that he moved to Tokyo when he was 20 years old to fulfill his dream of becoming a manga artist. But he became depressed at some point because when he offered Shingeki no Kyojin to publishers, he was told repeatedly that while his story is satisfactory, his drawing skills are not. Back on the competition circuit, Isayama submitted his one chart Heartbreak 1, winning himself a Special Encouragement Award in 2008. With his second one shot Ors, being selected the same year, you can clearly see the military aesthetic and a character design similar to Historia. After so many rejections, everything changed for Hajime Isayama in 2009, when Kotansha, which was less popular at the time, finally found a place for the one shot left by the budding manga creator from Oita Prefecture. Debuting in Bitsetsu Shonen Magazine, Attack on Titan became an instant award-winning hit. That was the fruit of his labor. His uncompromising vision and determination had finally earned him this place in the industry. Released during the zombie apocalypse craze, it was a big hit, taking anime mainstream from several manga spin-offs, crossover with Marvel, light novels, video games to an internationally recognized anime series, two-part live-action movie and an attraction at Universal Studios Japan. The success of Attack on Titan has even surprised the manga making industry, with his first ever serialized work reaching the heights of global success. Just like his character Irvin Smith, Hajime Isayama had gambled with the publication of his creation and won big time. The Inspiration So, how did he come up with the premise of the story? Isayama often mentions things by which his ideas were inspired by. So the original premise of the show is that all of humanity is surrounded by huge walls to protect themselves from man-eating giants. The towering mountain ranges of Oyama, Oita Prefecture, proved to be a huge inspiration for Isayama. He once said that the mountain ranges circling Oita made him feel very cut off from the world. He often wondered, if there were monsters lurking over those hilly peaks. He felt kinda trapped 
and wanted to explore and see the outside world. This feeling of isolation and a curiosity to explore is clearly visible in the story as the motivation for our main characters who want to leave the confines of the world surrounding humanity and feel a sense of freedom. So the characters in the show swing around like Spider-Man with swords to kill the tyrants. The idea of the 3D maneuver gear comes from Desert Punk, a manga which has been adapted into an anime series. The action scenes make use of wires to swing around and this influenced the idea of the vertical maneuvering equipment. The users wear the equipment around their waists and fire the wires with hooks through gas tanks, which grapple onto walls or trees. He didn't just copy the idea, he made it his own, like all great writers do. The idea of giant man-eating titans comes from a game he played when he was 19, called Mav Love Alternative, where aliens invade Earth and humanity has to take up arms against them in an all-out war. In an interview, Isayama stated that the titans aren't meant to be taken just as monsters. The artist had hoped that the creatures would be a representation of frustration and hopelessness of humanity. The aimless creatures cannot be understood by what is left of humanity, and Isayama said that they have come to embody the inexplicable challenges mankind has to face in the real world. He thought of this when he worked at an internet cafe and once encountered drunk patrons who had trouble connecting with their sober friends. The group's inability to communicate struck a chord with Isayama and this gave rise to the concept. Two of the main themes in the series are oppression and release. Beyond that, Isayama admitted that he didn't have any particular agenda or message that he wanted to convey. In this way, the themes, ideas and philosophies present in the show exist only to benefit the story and are incorporated naturally and don't feel forced. He has gained criticism because of exploring World War II and Holocaust-esque things in his story. The oppressed minorities becoming the oppressors, military takeover of a corrupt government and such. The Anime Adaptation When the manga first started, no one could have predicted that it would gain such massive critical, financial, and multicultural popularity. It was a crudely drawn dark fantasy, which isn't everybody's cup of tea. Tetsuro Araki, who was an anime director at the acclaimed studio Madhouse, Production IG, and Data Bit Studio, was the one put in charge to handle the anime adaptation. He had previously worked on Death Note and High School of the Dead, among other things. The one thing he excels at is crafting explosive bursts of action. So this series was perfect for him. The anime aired on 3rd April 2013 and exploded in popularity. The first two episodes hooked the audience from the get-go and each episode ended on a cliffhanger to keep the viewers hooked. The art style was vibrant, the animation was great, the voice acting was superb and the use of 3D assets was well blended with the 2D animation, which was a rarity back then. And the epic soundtrack tied it all together in a perfect bow. The first two episodes of the series have one of the strongest hooks a show can have to pull you in. In the opening shots of the series, we see our main characters looking in fear at a skinless giant with some cool narration to draw you in. Then we flash back to earlier in the day. We see Commander Irwin, Keith Shadows and the rest of the scouts in a dark and rainy forest riding on horses. We notice that they're all wearing the same uniform and we see them use the 3D maneuver gear to take down a giant creature. All this is conveyed visually. How easy it could have been to start off the series with Aaron's father when he got inside the walls. All the characters could have explained the story to him about how the world works. The rich live in the inner walls safe from the titans while the poor live near the outside the walls where they are more vulnerable. But this was all avoided in favor of adding mystery and a mythology to the world. So we see flashes of different events and the main character wakes up and we get to see their daily routine and learn about the ambitions of the characters and their thought process. The first episode has only just started and we have been presented with a lot of intriguing questions. Who made the walls? Where do these tritons come from? Is the walled city all that is left of humanity? What secrets is Aaron's dad hiding in the basement? 
What does the world religion have to do with all this? But we don't have time to think about that. Because BAM! The only barrier between peaceful everyday life and a gruesome death by being eaten alive has literally just come crashing down. We see just how powerless humans are against these colossal monstrosities, straight out of a nightmare. Aaron's mom gets crippled and eaten alive in front of him and the episode ends with the same narration it started with. Now that is how you do a first episode. うん、キャラクターがその今までの出来事を継承しながら、あの新しい出来事に直面していく。今のところその。たくさんあるんですけど、そのハラハラしながら見ること自体が。なんていうかな、やっぱこの作品にしかない。エンターテイメントだと思います
like in the aforementioned scene where Irwin's arm is bitten off, we see somebody go back to save him. Armin distracts Reiner and Bertolt and in the span of a few seconds, we get a lot of information. Somebody slices Bertolt. Wait, Irwin, that you? Woohoo, Eren's free. Mikasa's like, let's get the hell out of here. Yay, Armin's plan worked. And Irwin's like, we got what we came for, retreat, retreat everybody. All that in just a few shots conveyed visually. Similarly, the legendary reveal of Reiner and Bertolt's being so nonchalant was a genius move on Isayama's part and was further elevated to masterpiece status by the excellent pacing, music, animation and voice acting. Everything just comes together perfectly. Similar to season 1, season 2 ends on a mysterious note, making us question what's next. But you had to wait another year for season 3 to find out. Not for me though, I converted to the manga. <laughs> Season 3 went all political on us, with a fake king, corrupt government, coup d'etat, the good guys becoming wanted criminals and giving us even more mysteries. We got some human on human fight scenes and it was pretty fun. This arc in the manga was a bit of a mess. It was very poorly drawn and was supposed to be a slow burn and incorporate old west and political thriller elements which didn't quite work out. Isayama changed it up in the anime to make it more coherent and tightly paced. And then the lid popped open. The second half of season 3 incorporated all the best elements of the previous seasons into a breathtaking spectacle. Season 3 episodes 16 and 17 were the highest rated episodes of any show on IMDb for a while. All the build up, all the mysteries and waiting all these years had led to this. And it was awesome. You were confused about who to root for. The main characters were backed into a corner with no way out. We had heroic sacrifices, a suicide charge, battle tactics and hard decisions with excellent animation, soundtrack and voice acting. The hype had died down from when season 1 had aired but this brought it back. Overall I think season 2 had the best production cycle but this score had the highest highs in the series by far in all aspects. The mystery box approach to storytelling has not worked for most stories because it needs extreme care to be put into the story and the clues to be spread apart and not be too obvious while also being tangible. Thankfully, Isayama had done his homework and provided the necessary infrastructure to make the payoffs be worth it. All the mysteries were answered in a couple episodes and this type of reveal has never felt so satisfying even after such a long wait. Another one of the core strengths of the author is his ability to shift genres and keep the story unpredictable in regards to what's going to happen, but also keep you guessing and solving the mysteries by giving you bite-sized pieces to chew on and think about. Every season before this had ended in a cliffhanger type ending to keep you coming back for more, but this season ends on a bittersweet note. The characters are finally free, outside the walls, but now they know greater truths about the outside world that they wished they didn't know. Now the future is unclear, and for us, the audience, we are left to wonder what's next. Psych! Only the anime always have to wait. Us superior manga readers are always one step ahead. The story in the manga thus far. One of the major complaints of the previous seasons was a lack of atmospheric and quiet scenes. They were there but only a few and far between. But now in the Marley arc, everybody was confused at first. What is this? Who are all these new characters? Who is this mysterious new character who's a cripple? The story slowly builds and builds for 10 chapters, introducing these new characters, their backstories, fleshing out their personalities and motivations. In the earlier seasons, John was Isayama's favorite because he represented the everyman. But now Reiner is his favorite because he was basically an oppressed minority who was trained to kill his own kind to help his family. He was brainwashed to think that what he was doing was a righteous act and that he was saving the world. But after committing genocide at an early age, he got depressed and tries to go out Ernest Hemingway style. 
but ultimately decides against it. It turns out that the mysterious character was Eren, surprise surprise, and all these characters we got to know and like now hate our main characters because they did the same thing to them in taking revenge. This arc was masterfully told and Isayama just keeps on taking bigger and bigger risks in the story and most of them pay off, big time. The next arc starts the beginning of the end and everything just keeps getting crazier. The history of the titans is revealed and for the first time all the characters are spread apart doing their own thing, even more so than the uprising arc. The fates of the characters is unknown and Isayama is pulling no punches. Introducing time travel and tying some loose ends together, killing off all characters that have fulfilled their roles in the story and making unlikely alliances at the 11th hour. Mythology Every good story needs a good mythology, a story within a story to make the world more believable and lived in. So here's a quick rundown of the mythos. Long ago, the Fritz family came into power as the ruling family of the tribe of Eldia. Jamir, a young slave, is accused of a crime and hunted down by the Eldian tribe and gains the power of the titans from an unknown anomaly, becoming the founding titan. The king of the Eldian tribe, pleased with Jamir's power and accomplishments, takes her to bear his children. Jamir Fritz leads the Eldian tribe against Marley at the command of their king. Jamir defends her king from an assassination attempt at the hands of a Marlian soldier later named Helos, choosing to succumb to death from her wound. The king feeds Jamir's corpse to his daughters Maria, Rose and Sheena, who inherit Jamir's power of the titans. Jamir's consciousness survives in the paths, a metaphysical timeless space where she creates the bodies of the titans and carries out commands of the living royal family through the founding titan. Jamir's daughters bestow their power of the titans onto their grandchildren, leading to the eventual creation of the nine titans. Those who inherit the power of the titans are destined to die after 13 years just like Ymir. The great titan war happens, ethnic cleansing and genocide, the Ackerman clan becomes the sword and shield of the royal family, Karl Fritz, the 145th monarch, is ashamed of Eldia's history of genocide and civil war. Fritz conspires with the Tiber family to bring about Eldia's downfall. He gathers most of the Fritz royal family to Paradise Island. Over the course of the war, the Marleans succeed in gaining the power of six more of the nine titans possessed by Eldia and gradually gain control of the continent. In order to stop the war, King Fritz sends a false message to the people of Marley demanding that the surviving Eldians must be left alone or the colossal titans within the walls will flatten the earth. And thus the great titan war ends. Every Eldian on Paradise Island has their memories erased to believe that the whole world is filled with titans. Some time later, a homeless Eldian girl living in Marley is given the name Jamir by the leader of the cult of Ymir Fritz. The girl joins the cult and becomes a figure of worship. The cult of Ymir is found out and led through Marley in chains and are exiled to Paradise Island where they are all turned into pure titans. Grisha Jaeger joins the Eldian Restorationists after learning the truth of his sister's death. He meets Dinah Fritz, the last member of the Fritz bloodline in Marley. After receiving propaganda from the Owl, an Eldian spy, they make plans to retrieve the founding titan from Paradise Island in order to revive the nation of Eldia. Back on Paradise Island, Irvin's father, a great school teacher within the walls, questions the lies told by the government and gets killed. Grisha Jaeger gains the power of the attack titan and makes his way to the walls and starts a new life while investigating the royal family. Levi joins the scouts and Irvin becomes commander. The warriors are sent on a mission to recover the founding titan, Jamir, the second one, as a titan, eats one of the warriors and sneaks into the walls. The walls get knocked down and the series starts. So class, what did we learn today? Don't trust the blondies. Conclusion Over the 11 years of writing the manga, Isayama has truly grown as a mangaka and it shows. 
he has stated that he is a big fan of western media. At another point he said that Breaking Bad is a masterpiece because it ended with a bang. He started out as a newbie in the manga making industry, trying to get his story published. And now he's a married guy and one of the most successful mangaka ever. Right now the pressure is at an all time high with the final season closing in. He needs to end the story in a satisfying manner as quickly as possible. He has voiced concerns on this topic that he fears disappointing his audience. The story has expanded to such an extent that so many plot threads are hanging loose right now and it seems like a colossal task to tie everything together with a bow on top. Ever since chapter 125, the fanbase has been divided massively. Everybody is in their own camp, theorizing and criticizing. Isayama has not taken a break for over a decade until chapter 129 because of the coronavirus. He is very overworked and exhausted. Many authors feel like they are saying goodbye to an old friend when they finish a series. But Isayama feels like he is nearing the end of a marathon that he has been running for 11 years. He just wants to finish the series and open up a sauna. His creation has become a global phenomenon, but it has taken its toll on him. On top of all this, Wit Studio handed over the IP to Studio Mappa, which many fans have also voiced concerns over. On top of all this, the final season is going to adapt much more story material than any of the previous seasons, so it may feel rushed if not handled properly. This ain't gonna be as big as a JoJo season after all. Regardless of how the story ends, the journey has been an amazing one. Besides, a lot of people complained during the Uprising arc that it wasn't fun anymore and Isayama changed it up for the anime. Another example is that many people thought that the Marley arc was boring, but it also made sense in hindsight. We should all be cautiously optimistic because Isayama hasn't led us astray so far. Everything that has been built up from the beginning is paying off. So I'm hopeful that everything will turn out fine. Isayama and Studio Mappa's reputation is on the line. And if by any chance it does end on a high note, then this will be remembered as a modern master. So this was a story of how Isayama got into the industry and how the story of Attack on Titan progressed in the manga and the anime. I hope you liked it and thanks for watching.